we provide a host of services, uh, somewhat in some cases traditional to incubation or acceleration, mentoring, business guidance, business development, financial strategies. Uh, most of all, we are not a funding source, but we will get you access to funding sources, such as what we have our guest speaker here this morning, and a host of services that you can see here on the screen is, is really what we do. Being virtual opens up the services that we do globally. There are places around the world where incubators, accelerators, might not have access to qualified mentors, consultants, professionals, and talent. We provide the best quality mentors and talent no matter where in the world they happen to be and match them up with your needs and requirements. It's a, it's a, it's a real paradigm shift in the world of incubation and acceleration. I hate using those words because they've been genericized and overused, but that's kind of where, where, where we fall. So if there's an interest in developing your business, in growing your technology enterprise, looking for funding, preparing for funding, uh, we want to be your go-to source no matter where in the world you happen to be. And that's the great thing about being virtual. We take full advantage of all the latest and greatest in communications, telecommunications, video communications, text, email, voice, face-to-face, -face, whatever, whatever gets the job done, and, and, and that's kind of what we do. So we invite you to contact us if you have any questions. If you'd like to be a mentor, we'd love to have professionals as mentors. And we have some people in the audience today who might very well qualify as mentors within their respective industries. Um, if you'd like to be a sponsor of this event and become a sponsor on our site, we'd love to have you participate as a company or as a mentor, and, and that branches out. And of course, we're always on the hunt for good clients. So if you're interested, uh, we'd, we'd love to have you and invite you into our family. So I'd also like to give you a heads up. Uh, this coming week, there is the New Energy Symposium for 2012, which is being held at the New York Academy of Sciences. This is, uh, I believe, the seventh annual symposium. Uh, we have been involved as iClean uh, directly. And one of our companies, who you'll hear, RE3, this morning is actually presenting as one of the 13 finalists in that business plan competition uh, to be held in Manhattan next week. So uh, this is uh, kind of a, a warm-up session for Drew to make sure he gets everything right before uh, presenting to, I'd say, about 50 to 100 top venture capitalists from all over the world. Brian, are you, are you a judge at that event next week? Oh, Brian escaped. Okay. <laughs> um, it's an exciting event. It's uh, well attended, uh, well done. A lot of funding opportunities are derived from that event. So as a partner uh, in, in iClean, we like to promote what they do. If you need more information about the event, uh, come see me afterwards, and, and we'll let you know what's going on. Um, is, our, is our Skype person online? Somebody? No? One minute. Two minutes. Okay. Um, there are other events taking place throughout the city. Uh, we are in the process of modifying our website to include a full-scale events page, which will be events taking place everywhere from upstate New York right through Manhattan and Long Island. Uh, without, without question, those involved in clean tech and energy you can go to a, a conference or an event literally every night. Um, and in some cases, you can go to two or three every night. Uh, you got to choose which one the food is best at so you know where to go and the information that you want to receive and the people that you want to meet. But there is a host of activity, and I don't see much slowdown for the summer. So um, we'll be having that events page up shortly. As well, we'll be launching our new blog. Uh, very soon, which will provide information and opportunity for you to give us feedback 
on what you'd be interested in, what you would like to see, and how we can better serve the clean tech community worldwide. So with that, if our, if our guest from Sweden is not online yet, and I'm not sure if he is or he isn't, I can't really see into the mirror. Is he online? Somebody give me a heads up. No. Okay, so why don't we change the order a little bit? Okay. Uh, yeah, I like to play that, but um, we finish with that as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'll ask Drew. Or Drew, are you going to be ready? Can you? Uh, let's do that. Let's uh, change it up a little bit. We'll bring up Drew Gorman. Let me get his presentation fired up here. No, I got it. I got it. We're good. Come on up. Let me introduce Drew. Um, we had been talking to Drew as a contact from uh, our colleague Pete Gronendahl for some time, and we finally got engaged a little earlier on this year. And we found his technology fascinating. I found Drew fascinating. Uh, Drew is a musician, and he's been involved in financial services. He's had more careers than I even even I have. And, that, that, that's an amazing uh, thing all, all on, unto itself. And with the help of uh, mentors, John Lonzak and other people, uh, we have gotten to this stage with RE3, which I think you're going to find very exciting. Drew, come on up. Stop scribbling. Because this won't work with the PDF. his presentation on RE3. Thank Go for you. it. Thank you all for uh, being here today. Really appreciate it. Uh, I guess this is my, my weapon of mass destruction here. That I can, oh, no, this is, did I just skip? Is that what I did? Uh, let's go the other way. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Les Newman for inviting me here. Les has been instrumental in helping RE3 uh, after 12 years of research uh, make its way to the U.S. Uh, relatively successfully and to put together a game plan that uh, certainly makes sense to us. Uh, I'd also like to thank John Lonzak. John, you're the man. Thanks so much for helping us organize our thoughts. We had 80 to 100 pages of information that we were giving to various uh, venture capital groups and private investors, which is, as you all know, way too much. Even when I, I'm an investor, uh, I'm a financial securities professional, I have various licenses, SEC licenses. When someone says to me, we'd like to do this or that, and they want to hand me a package, I really don't want to get 80 or 90 pages. It's not that I, I'm not interested. I just don't have time to read that. And these gentlemen helped us boil this down to a point where I could make a, uh, well, we've timed this so I can do it in 10 minutes. I'm not going to do it in 10 minutes right now. Otherwise, uh, you probably wouldn't uh, catch much of it uh, because of me, not because of you. But uh, also because uh, there is a little bit more time, I'm going to be a little bit more relaxed and get into a little bit more detail than I uh, probably w will do when we get to our presentation in New York City on the 18th. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, Ramsey McPhillips. He's not here. Ramsey is one of our uh, number one guys uh, uh, in terms of uh, having a ter terrific, probably the most advanced view of the landscape of MSW, the waste streams in the United States and globally, the technologies that are available. He and a gentleman named Jim Lackey, uh, they're both from Oregon. I searched the United States uh, to find people like this, and these two people uh, I selected to work with RE3 in getting to the next uh, stage of development, which is uh, pretty close to the final stage of development. And I'd like to thank Peter Gronendahl sitting here in the audience, because if it wasn't for Pete, I wouldn't have met any of these people. So thanks very much, Pete. Really appreciate it. Pete and I have known each other, and we've been good friends for, I don't know, 
almost 15 years. It goes back quite a while. Can't say that about a lot of people these days. Uh, I'd like to thank ICANN, which is a great name for that organization. Uh, ICLEAN, another great name. Uh, the College of uh, Nanoscale Science and Engineering, which I had the privilege uh, of touring, and my son had the privilege of touring. Uh, he's very much involved in physics and things like that. And he looked at the place and uh, he said, he's a freshman in college, and he said, Dad, would you do me a favor? Just let me go to one more year of regular school, regular college, <laughs> before I have to put the white coat on. And so I said, no problem. Uh, and I'd like to thank the president of, of uh, RE3. He, it's a very difficult time of the year for him. He's one of the primary uh, contractors for the Archdiocese of New York. Uh, I've been doing this for many, many years. One of the finest uh, contractors in the country. Uh, involved uh, from the very beginning with RE3. Put uh, well over $5 million into RE3. So far, the individuals who own RE3 have put uh, over $12 million into, into the company. Uh, over the last 10 years and brought it through multiple stages where we're really at the uh, final stage of uh, uh, kickoff, so to speak. Even though we've made improvements along the way, we plan on making more improvements as time goes on, uh, we're at a stage now where I think we're light years ahead of any other company that's doing anything like or similar to what we're doing. Uh, and hopefully that'll be uh, apparent uh, during this presentation. And uh, uh, also to uh, people who are involved in the investment community, it'll become apparent to them, I think, if they're in the, in the know about this industry, what we're doing and how it is on the cutting edge. One of the things that inspired me to bring in our ARG and our West Coast group was I met with the DEC, Department of Environmental Conversa uh, Conservation. They made it very clear to me that even though we were producing, we were converting garbage MSW, uh, municipal, municipal Solid Waste, anybody who's not familiar with that, MSW I'm going to be using quite frequently. Uh, they said, look, we love what you have. It's the probably the, uh, the, the best uh, type system we've seen in this environment, uh, but we don't want any burning because it, our plan at that time was to take what we produce, which is cellulosic fiber, when we convert garbage not using any uh, uh, fire or burning or whatever. We, we use steam. We use something that was created in the, the end of the last, well, I guess, I don't know, century? Dec uh, uh, the end of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s, uh, steam was uh, part of the Industrial Revolution. So we use steam, but we use a particular type, type of steam. It is our intellectual property. It has a lot to do with uh, the way we do things that nobody else has been able to do. It's related directly to our computer system and our software, our IP, intellectual property, which nobody has been able to duplicate. We protect it primarily by having a self-destruct mechanism in it. It cannot be opened up. If it's opened up, it doesn't work. Uh, so uh, we've gone the route, that route, rather than uh, the patent route. Uh, we've spoke with many law firms because if we hadn't done that, there'd probably be 20 of these plants already open in China right now. No offense to China if there's anybody watching from China, which I doubt. Uh, but we have had conversations with people from China and Hong Kong, especially uh, being an island. Uh, Brendan Hughes, uh, the president has had a great vision. He stuck with it all these years, and he gave me a mission. He said, uh, this is about a year ago, he said, I don't want you to stop. Do whatever it takes. Talk with whom, whoever you have to speak with to get the point across until you can find people who get it. And bring those people in and let's make a deal. We're looking to raise about $10 million for the marketing of this company. We already have all the, the product. We have all the research done. Uh, KPMG was our... Uh, lead uh, researcher and accounting firm and uh, uh, assistant in the beginning when we were in Europe, which is much stricter than the United States, and we, we uh, put up our first pilot plant in Europe, uh, which was very successful, and uh, have all the documentation for that, which has been documented by KPMG and Babcock and a number of other scientific uh, uh, laboratories, et cetera. 
Uh, so now let me go on after uh, taking a few extra minutes, which I won't get my next presentation, to talk a little bit about uh, what you're going to see here. And, and uh, if I can uh, get reasonably good control of this, we can do we, we can do it. If, oh, I can. Okay, we can do it efficiently. Um, let's talk about uh, the, the problem that's coming up, or that actually exists. The World Bank uh, has done a study, as you can see up here, and it's projecting by 2025 that there's going to be 375 billion tons of MSW annually. Now, we think it's more than that, mainly because we don't know if the numbers from India or China are reliable or if they've even been included in this study. Uh, so you, you, somewhere between 375 and five or 600 billion tons of MSW is going to be created. Someone's got to get rid of this. Now, when we met with the D DEC, they said, we love your system except for one thing. We don't want any burning, no burning. We don't want uh, uh, cogeneration plants. We don't want plants that burn, just burn garbage. We don't want gasification plants. We want a system where from cradle to grave, we're recycling everything, resourcing everything, and uh, recovering everything. And that actually is what RE3 stands for. And we had created RE3 and the name prior to me meeting with way before the DEC. I met with them about a year and a half ago. Uh, resource recycling and recovery is what RE3 stands for. Now, to take a quick look at what we've got here, you see MSW at the top, then you see RE3 because the MSW comes into RE3, it's trucked into an RE3 plant, which is a very small footprint. We're between 50 and 60,000 square feet. Uh, here's what we create, you look at those lines coming down. Recyclables, high quality recyclables. They, they've been sanitized, delabeled, you name it, they're just ready to go. Compost, green fuel, insulation, if the uh, uh, if our product, which is cellulosic fiber, uh, uh, someone chooses to use it for insulation, can be used for that. And AD feedstock, which is anaerobic digestion, which is what New York State and most of the world wants. They want anaerobic digestion. Compost was a great idea, is a good idea, except for one problem. When compost was done on a mass scale, on a larger scale, and then the, the compost itself was tested, it was found that the compost had some problems, serious problems. Toxic metals, heavy metals. Because in the garbage we receive, in that MSW up the top there, there are copious amounts of toxic, toxic metals. Now, copious amounts, they may be measured in parts per million, but it's, they're toxic, and when you ended up with all this compost, which is wonderful, it's the best way to do things except for one thing, you don't get rid of the uh, toxic metals or the other toxicities. We do this. Uh, we don't do it by composting. I'll explain how we do this. RE3 has the greenest solution to, growing M uh, to the growing MSW problems and expenses. We convert MSW from an expensive burden to a valuable commodity. And we do it using steam. We don't use it, we don't use heat, we don't use fire, none of that. RE3 is more than a logistical and cost reduction solution, MSW. It is also a profit center. Uh, RE3 is a, a revolutionary, simple, unique, and lucrative MSW system uh, that produces a pure organic cellulosic fiber. We convert MSW. We don't burn it, we convert it. And it's, a, it's a, our own uh, intellectual process that does this. Uh, we create a feedstock that is used uh, for anaerobic digestion. It accelerates the anaerobic digestion problem uh, or situation. Uh, generally speaking, anaer anaerobic digestion takes a long time, not with cellulosic fiber. We're able to produce massive amounts of CH4, which is natural gas. Um, at, the, at the end of our cycle, we end up with a uh, compost. I'll explain that. And uh, we're, we remove the heavy metals, and then we're able to sell that. We, our green fuel is the organic cellulosic fiber. There are some entities that would like to burn that. 
For instance, in Haiti, they're now burning their forests to eat, to cook. They'd prefer to have our pellets or our briquettes, and, uh, and we're very flexible. We can produce both. We can produce energy in the form of CH4 of gas, uh, or we can produce the fiber, the, uh, the pellets. And so we have a lot of flexibility. We're the only company that really has that. And it also can be used as uh, architectural insulation. Uh, our system is based on autoclaves. You can see one here. This is a 60-ton autoclave controlled by our proprietary software. Unique, uh, our software, uh, there is nowhere in the, pr in the planet that you will find our software. It is uh, probably impossible to duplicate, although it will be somewhere over the next four or five years. I'm sure there will be some reverse engineering and someone will figure out how to do it. But, but the uh, barrier to entry is years uh, for other companies. Uh, we refined this over a decade of development work. Uh, it's scalable, modulable, and expandable. Uh, the plant design, we can put two units, four units, six units, eight units. We've talked with Hong Kong. They have 19,000 tons a day. We can handle 19,000 tons a day. If that's what is needed, that's what we can do. It's just a matter of how many of these units we put in and uh, how much gas uh, you're ready for because we're going to produce a lot of gas and very quickly and it's very high quality gas so it needs very little cleaning if any and it's immediately available to be put into substations and it can e even be compacted if necessary uh, and used locally uh, it's uh, clean we have negative air plants uh, our product is carbon credit qualified and we've done that in Europe uh, reduces MSW volume by 80%, not the weight, but the volume. Uh, it captures non-recycled recyclables. Well, what does that mean? It simply means that even though we're recycling as much as we possibly can, and it's the law, it's not being done. Only about 50%, and the DEC will be the first to tell you this, only about 50% of recyclable products are being recycled. The rest of them are going into our waste stream. Well, that's not a problem for us. In fact, if it wasn't for the law in New York State, we just say, let us take it all. Because we separate it, we recycle everything. There isn't anything that goes to waste. And we end up separating the heavy metals and the toxins. And a lot of them have resale value. And the ones that don't, we uh, take care of them uh, in the ways that are prescribed by law. Uh, we make money with tipping fees, uh, with our feed stock, which is used to accelerate anaerobic digestion. We create massive amounts of methane, CH4, uh, recycled materials. Our cellulosic fiber is considered a green fuel. Uh, garden markets, markets in terms of our compost or our uh, uh, the uh, related products, uh, building products, insulation, and others. Uh, RE3 plants uh, versus current options. We're a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the time to, to build one of our units, and I'll show you a, a chart on that in a minute, a fraction of the footprint, and a fraction of operating expenses. And you can see quickly at the bottom line here, for the lucky municipality or organization that owns one of our plants or buys one of our plants, you can see the break-even point is year three. These are very conservative numbers. And uh, year five, this lucky municipality is probably lowering the taxes in their community. Now, I don't know how many municipalities you know of right now that are in a position to lower their taxes. I don't know of any. And we have a, a current bid in with uh, Sullivan County or about to place a bid in with them, I should say. We've got a, crest, a request for a bid. And uh, they're gonna, they're, they have a great treasurer, a uh, great legislat uh, legislature. Uh, but they will, in my estimation, not be in great shape, even though they have a triple-A rating right now. I don't know how long that's going to last. A matter of a couple of years, three years, I don't know. They'll be the experts to tell you that. We will be the uh, solution, hopefully, for them for that because they will start making money, and this will offset many of their other expenses and probably balance their budget with a surplus just by taking their garbage and other garbage that's around uh, hopefully regionally, because the DEC has asked us to work with more counties than just one, which is why we have not jumped on Sullivan County, because the DEC said, we love this so much, could you do it in multiple counties? Could you do an analysis of multiple counties and tell us how many units we really need? Do we need six in six counties? Can we use three or two 
or four? How many do we need? Or one uh, with uh, four units in it or two units in it? And these are the kinds of studies that we do before we come in and build a plant. Uh, here you see uh, some of our objectives. Uh, we're looking to sell uh, and license uh, about 33 plants over the next five years. We think the market is much greater than that, but we wanted to be very conservative. We're looking to raise about $10 million for operational licensing and engineering expenses. Uh, the revenue stream, profits from plant sales, uh, uh, and uh, royalties. We get a, a slight royalty for everything that's made from every plant or, or uh, that's produced. And also, we are an engineering company, so in the, at least in the beginning, we'll be getting engineering fees for, uh, for most likely, for getting a plant off the ground. And eventually, as you can see, RE3, after year five, that's a triple net number of $212 million. Uh, our, that's only on 33 units. We expect in five years to have over 50 units, perhaps 75 units built, highly profitable. Uh, the margins are terrific. And therefore, there may be some profits from RE3-owned plants. Right now, we only plan on selling our plants. The, uh, our target markets, uh, to the left, you can read these if you like. Municipalities are my favorite. We're dealing with the military right now. Islands, cities, states, nations, think Hawaii, Hong Kong, uh, anywhere where uh, they can't get rid of their garbage. Uh, Hawaii's high-tech solution is putting their garbage on a barge and sending it to the mainland of the United States. Uh, you've ta we've talked with Disney World, perfect group for it to work with us. We're talking with them now. Uh, hopefully that those talks will go further. They need us. Primary targets, low-lying fruit, uh, plenty of uh, outdated equipment out there. Uh, almost all of the organizations that are getting rid of garbage need to cut costs. Uh, there are many uh, uh, municipalities, companies without MSW systems. Uh, our byproducts are very valuable. Uh, our anaerobic digestion system is second to none and produces a tremendous amount of gas very quickly on a regular basis without uh, being stopped 24-7, 365. We have backup systems, et cetera. Obviously, we have a source of our own energy, so we don't have to worry about blackouts and things like that. Uh, uh, targets in need of carbon credits, that's primarily in Europe and uh, new revenue sources. Uh, every municipality I've spoken with, I've been all over the country, many parts of the world. Very few entities uh, are benefiting in any way by uh, their garbage. They're losing money, it's costing them a fortune, and they need sources of revenue. The people in the communities, I know in my community, I don't want to pay any more taxes. I don't know anybody here wants to volunteer to pay some more taxes like some of the wealthier people we've heard of recently who I don't believe who want to pay more taxes. But I think we ought to just put a box on our, on our IRS forms that says, yes, I'd like to pay some more taxes and let those people pay more taxes if they'd like to do that. With our system, there really be, will be no reason to do that. We produce enough money, enough profit for the municipalities and the governments so that, they, that they'll be able to balance their budgets relatively quickly. Uh, our startup is very quick. Um, the mar current market trends, as you all probably know, landfills are at capacity. They're being closed. Nobody here wants to live near a landfill. Nobody wants a landfill built in their backyard. And God forbid you have one. You, you'd surely like to get rid of one, just like they closed the one in Sullivan County. Waste management systems are aging. Costs are rising. Recyclables are entering the MSW stream system. What does that mean? That means just what I said before. People, even in my own home, and we're very conscientious. I worked on the Hudson River and helped clean that with Pete Seeger many years ago, built a ship. And no matter how hard you try, you can't, they're just, as much as we try in our house to recycle everything, someone throws a can in the garbage, someone throws a bottle in the garbage. As it turns out, about 40 to 50 percent of recyclables end up in the garbage stream. Well, we're the answer to that, because once it comes to us, it's fine with us comes into our system, we process it, we sterilize it, comes out the other side, we separate it. It's either sold or given away to companies that can uh, use it for recycling purposes. Uh, the uh, burning or gasification MSW is expensive. It's environmentally, it's terrible. And it's being banned. It's, it, eventually it will be banned. Even the ones that are being built right now, and there are a few, unfortunately, that are being built right now, and people are wasting their money, and they'll find out sooner or later that that's what's happening. Uh, but uh, these things are the gasification and burning. 
The reason that they're being bur- uh, banned is, is because they pollute, but the other reason is because they burn items or they vaporize in terms of gasification items that you can just recycle. And the government, our federal and state governments, don't want to burn things that can be recycled, and for good reason. And there's an awful lot of people in the United States and the world that would prefer to take things we've already made and not have to destroy them and make them again. Those things that we have to, we have to. Other things we can recycle, let's recycle them. And if we can make money recycling them, let's make some money recycling them. What's wrong with that? So then you have, uh, there are very few, uh, right now there are no profitable gasification plants. I think there's only one or two that are even open. State and federal mandates are, uh, to reduce MSW uh, volumes are in place and pending. Valuable waste is being thrown away. Municipalities have to lower their expenses, seek affordable solutions, find new revenues. Trash management procedures are in flux. The public is becoming aware. Landfill-based toxins and environmental uh, damage, they, they're seeing it. It's becoming much more apparent. Uh, now, some of the resistance existing waste management equipment is still being advertised, but that's coming to an end. Uh, the three big waste management companies do control the market, unfortunately. That's coming to an end. Uh, their contracts are expiring. People do not want to renew landfills or expand landfills. Uh, most of them are at capacity, and uh, they're now even difficult to build and expensive to acquire. And the big three companies out there right now are beginning to seek new uh, solutions and options, and we are one of them. Uh, this is a, uh, an interesting chart. The top section of the chart, working down to RE3 in the center, shows the companies that are currently involved in some form of what, we're, what we've already done. Uh, and they're uh, maybe five to seven years behind us. Uh, the companies underneath us, landfill gasification, burning cogeneration, these companies uh, are companies that are dinosaurs. They will be disappearing uh, pretty soon. But the main thing is, if you look across the green area, uh, tons per year for typical uh, plant, 300,000 300, tons, and we can do m- more than that. It's 300,000 plus. Uh, diversion rate. How much does not get to the landfill? 80%. Uh, is diverted. That landfill under, where it says landfill uh, under RE3, uh, I'll, I'll just step over and point it out here. This is, a, whoop, this is a mistake. That's zero. Landfills have zero diversion, diversion rate. All of their product is going into um, uh, landfills. But you look across it at, at the green line where uh, RE3 is. We're able to fiber to energy, fiber to compost, fiber to green fuel, fiber to insulation, anaerobic digestion, CH4. We recover the recyclables. And then there are other profit centers and other services that we render that make us money and benefit society, benefit the planet, and whoever owns the, uh, the systems. Uh, if you look at the jobs we produce, it's a job producer. These are sustainable, high-quality jobs. The footprint is small. The time to build is uh, less than a year. We can be up and operating, and we can set up multiple units around the world. We have construction people. The owner of our company, uh, or the, I should say the principal, uh, Brendan Hughes, is in the construction business, and we have several other people in the construction business. There's only nine people part of our company. Uh, uh, Cost to build, 50 million. Can it go to 70 million? Yeah. But look at the other numbers. We're a fraction of what it costs to build. We can build them quickly at a fraction of the cost. We make money right away. And the profit factor is extremely high. Uh, This is just a a sort of a a summary. Uh, RE3 group, we were founded in 2000. Uh, Our first uh, uh, facility was built in Limerick, Limerick, Ireland. We're very familiar with much more strict uh, requirements in terms of uh, everything you can think of regarding uh, this uh, MSW, et cetera, and the treatment, uh, dealing with waste systems because they're much more strict in Europe. Uh, it's based on the Wilson Autoclave steam uh, treatment process and his software, which is remarkable, and it is our uh, uh, IP, which is no one will uh, have for, for years. Uh, our, uh, we, we brought RE3 to the United States as a totally separate entity. 
We're not a wholly owned subsidiary. We're a separate entity in the United States. Uh, we uh, incorporated anaerobic digestion uh, in 2012, mainly because of what we found out in the United States. Nobody wants to burn anymore. That's a recent uh, and but very significant uh, happening. Uh, nobody wants to, uh, to burn, period. So our anaerobic digestion system is light years ahead of anything else out there. Uh, we became a member of iClean in 2012. This is a list of some of the people who were involved here. Again, thanks to Les Newman, John Lonzak, who are our primary advisors. Uh, I'll go to the, uh, the summary here. Uh, 33 plants we're looking to uh, uh, over the next five years, uh, our net is about 230 million. That's a conservative net. Uh, we're looking for about 10 million in investment uh, for the, to build these plants. We're the least expensive, most lucrative, and green MSW process to date. We have the smallest footprint, quickest build MSW processing plant. We convert waste to energy. Essentially, we're a manufacturing plant that takes MSW and manufactures it and turns it into energy. And our raw product, we're paid to take in, find another company that is in that situation. There isn't one that we know of. Uh, this is my final uh, uh, screen. That's my number. That's my personal cell phone number. Please feel free to call it. You can write it down. I have cards. I'll be happy to give it to you. If you don't feel like jotting it down now, you won't get a service. You're not going to, you may not get me, but I'll call you within 24 hours or probably call you in an hour. Uh, that's my number, 914-844-9246. Uh, you get me. Now, there's, we have other numbers or whatever, but that's the number you want to you want to call. The bottom section shows what a, a plant with four autoclaves are. Those are those in the left-hand side and in the middle. You see the garbage coming in, goes into the autoclaves, and that's the rest of the process. This is not a, a this is not take hundreds of acres. This is 50,000. This may be 65,000 square feet. And then on top, you can see just a schematic of how the garbage comes into the left. It actually doesn't go into a trough anymore. It's done on a flat surface. We've experimented with that, and we've got that down. It doesn't go up anymore. It goes straight on a conveyor belt into that tube there, which is um, the autoclave. From the autoclave, we process it uh, into a uh, very quickly into uh, it, it's already in cellulosic fiber. Every hour and a half, 45 tons is done in each one of these. Every hour and a half, 45 tons of cellulosic fiber is created. And the rest of the tonnage is recyclables. And after this is done, we bring this into, uh, if, if we're not going to pelletize it, if somebody doesn't want our pellets or they, they prefer to have the CH4, we uh, combine this with human waste, with cake, which saves municipalities millions of dollars. Uh, give you an example, and this is the end of my presentation here. Sailasic, uh, or I should say, um, Sullivan County is paying $100 a ton to have their human cake taken away. Well, we'll certainly do it for less, but if they own it, they don't have to pay anything or, or just trucking to move it from all their facilities, combine it with their cellulosic fiber, and create tremendous amounts of CH4. And that has multiple values. It can be used in two major ways. One, it can be put into substations that are located all over the United States, and you get credits for that. Or it can now be compressed and uh, create uh, off-the-grid situations for uh, airports, hospitals, uh, corporations, uh, plan unit developments, et cetera, et cetera. That is the future of uh, energy in America. That's the end of my presentation. I don't know if I have time for questions, but I see that our, our next guest may be uh, coming up and available. So I will remain here for the next few hours. And if anyone would like to speak with me, I'd be happy to speak with them. And now I'd like to turn it over to you, Les. We've got time for about two questions, and then we'll need to, to move on. Anybody have questions? you got to step up to the microphone. A little different. I'm tired of That's running right around with the microphone. And Hi. Uh, question I have is, uh, what kind of thank you. What kind of regulatory obstacles are you still finding in the United States uh, and with local municipalities? For example, uh, anything with uh, the Qu the Clean Air Act, uh, federal, or um, even regulations having to do with uh, trucking all of that stuff into a particular plant. Uh, what kind of challenges are you facing? Yeah, uh, 
our feedback initially, because we're about to make all of our applications for all those purposes, our feedback has been that we are the preferred organization when it comes to the EPA, the SEC. We don't burn. Uh, the trucking is another situation, but we have offered to uh, convert the uh, engines to gas engines uh, for pollution purposes. However, in trucking, remember, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, that most garbage is brought to a site, a transfer station, and then more trucks have to be taken in, and then the garbage is put back on trucks and brought to a landfill. We eliminate all of that. So that you're talking about less than 5% of what we get take in goes to a landfill. We're talking about a 95% redu reduction or greater in landfills. We're going to get rid of landfills. That's our plan to get rid of landfills. There's going to be some, another... We're still doing R&D to, to take care of those things. But the real answer is that since we haven't applied, I don't want to make any claims, but I can tell you that the DEC is thrilled with what we're doing. We're not doing a lot of the things that require a lot of those permits. We will be uh, uh, applying for all those permits. And uh, my honest answer is that we, we uh, are uh, expecting, we are preparing for the worst. We have been told that uh, we really will not get much resistance. In fact, the DEC told us if we were willing to work regionally, they would work with us to accelerate how quickly we get our permits, including the permits to move the cake from the uh, municipalities to wherever we're going to do anaerobic digestion. They just love that idea because they don't want any burning. We have time for one more question, and then we'll move on. Anybody? Drew, thank, thank you, so you very much. much. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Les. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Good job, buddy. Okay. Give me one second. All right. Good. I will assume that our, our guest is on from uh, Sweden. Kai, are you there? I'm here. Good morning. Anybody help? One minute. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, can let me do a very, a very brief introduction of, of our guest. Um, Kai Embrin was recommended to us from our uh, partner colleague in Sweden, Lars Ling. Kai has been involved in clean tech since the uh, word clean tech was founded back in the early 1990s. And he's, he was very, very in instrumental in developing a worldwide following for clean tech was a founder of and speaker of the 1992 Clean Tech Conference in Rio. And he's been a strong promoter, developer, and proponent of clean tech worldwide since then. Um, do we have him on board? I'm still getting the one minute high sign. So. Um, How are we doing? Uh, for anybody that's interested, our, our conference this morning is being moderated online. So people around the world can uh, click in through our chat session on Ustream. Uh, Sarah is our moderator this morning. And obviously, if you have a question here, you got to come up to the microphone. Identify yourself, if you would, please, and, uh, and ask, ask the question. So we've got to change the format a little bit so that we can eliminate a lot of the confusion. If he's not online, we'll, we'll just move along. Uh, Les, he is online. Um, we're not hearing any audio. Maybe he could just We're not the hearing audio. the audio. Can you test your audio, please? Uh, we don't get it resolved in the next couple of seconds. We'll just, we'll just move along. One day Skype will work exactly right.
All right, why don't we move on? Um, Brian, you ready? Okay. With that, let me introduce our, our, our featured speaker this morning. Uh, let me get his presentation pulled up here. Maybe even we can spell the name of his company correctly this time. It would be nice. Um, Brian's been a friend for a number of years. He uh, and Stonehenge are one of the premier uh, capital forming organizations in New York State. And we are very, very, very privileged to have him here this morning to, to give us an overview of evaluating the potential for investment, not only here in the Hudson Valley, but throughout the state, what they look for, how they evaluate a company, how they evaluate opportunities, and what the future is uh, for investment for early stage, mid stage, and uh, further on down the road. Brian, my pleasure. Make sure you're up to speed here. Okay. If you want to push the bottom button, you can advance your slides. That button there. Okay. So thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Brian Modell with Stonehenge Capital. Um, you can tell here we uh, we selected the name Stonehenge because Stonehenge has been out on the Salisbury Plain for close to 4,000 years, and you know we tend to focus on uh, technology-enabled investments. And Stonehenge was such an innovative uh, technological uh, advancement at the time; uh, they still don't know exactly why it was built or how it was built. So goes along with Les's, uh, Les's concept of if you can understand it, it's obsolete. Uh, we still don't understand it, and it still serves as, a, uh, as an inspiration to us. Uh, you'll find that I'm a visual thinker. Um, I, I kind of hate PowerPoint, so I'm really just more going to talk, and um, we'll, we'll go through these slides and talk about the kinds of things that we look for and what we focus on. Uh, what really separates Stonehenge uh, is our mission, um, and it's right here. Stonehenge aims to catalyze the rapid growth of companies in up-and-coming markets by backing passionate entrepreneurs who are solving business problems. Stonehenge is focused on finding investment opportunities in underserved markets, areas where there's an abundance of entrepreneurship and innovation, but a relative shortage of locally available, professionally managed capital. I spend a lot of time in upstate New York. Um, my partner is based down in Tampa. And you can see here that Stonehenge spun out of Bank One back in 1999. Uh, we manage over $600 million of capital that is specifically regionally targeted in eight states with offices in six of those eight states. Uh, the vast majority of that capital is targeted towards later stage lending to manufacturing and distribution companies. I like to say that my later stage colleagues like to lend money to metal benders. Um, what I do, what my partner in Tampa does, is we focus on growth equity stage companies, uh, primarily technology-enabled companies that are going to be applying technology to solve a business problem, focused in the southeast, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and the northeast, primarily upstate New York, western Pennsylvania, and other areas where there's a wealth of innovation, but yet a shortage of locally available capital. Um, in addition to the direct investment and the regionally focused funds that we operate, Stonehenge is also the nation's largest um, tax credit allocatee for new markets tax credits. We have about $600 million that, we, uh, that our new markets tax credit group manages uh, targeting community development opportunities in underserved markets. We do that in partnership with the National Urban League. And we also operate um, another group of tax credit uh, services focused around entertainment finance. Uh, we do have, we have looked at green energy uh, tax credits before. I believe there's a program in North Carolina and, and a few other states. Really what's most important here, uh, aside from all the different tentacles that Stonehenge has into our communities, is that we really have been successful by building relationships, excuse me, by building relationships and becoming partners in the communities in which we operate. Uh, I'm currently vice president of the Upstate Venture Association of New York, known as Uvani. Uh, next year I'm likely to be president. 
Uh, my partner is president or former president of the Florida Venture Forum. And we find that by becoming part of the community, instead of just the guy from the city with the money, by becoming part of the community, building the trusted relationships with groups like ICANN, with organizations like the Upstate Venture Association, it really allows you to build trust, get to know the people in the community, see the right opportunities when other people aren't looking for them. And that's really what's been uh, unique about us. One of the things that I'm going to talk about with you guys today is um, how do you make sure that you, as an entrepreneur, and your companies are good matches for securing private investment, uh, typically venture capital investment? And what are some of the characteristics of your company that are going to make it uh, most likely for you to achieve success raising that capital because we know how difficult that is? One of the things I always like to start with is why entrepreneurship? Uh, why, why do people go out and create businesses? Is it because they want to be famous? Is it because you want to be the king? You want to be the boss of your, of your own company, have all the power? Or is it because you want to be rich? Or is it because, where's the glow here? Or is it because you want to change the world? All of those, of course, are valid reasons. Um, entrepreneurship is the key to economic development, key to the growth of our communities. The US has been a leader in innovation, in commercializing innovation, creating jobs and building our economy. Uh, and that's something that we think is very important. One of the things that uh, is very interesting to me is that venture-backed companies represent 11% of the total jobs in the United States. All this data that I have is United States data that's been provided by the National Venture Capital Association available on their website. I've provided the link as well. These 11% uh, shows a growth in venture-backed jobs over the last 10 years. And even in the economic downturn of the last few years, that number has remained constant. When you think of the companies uh, and the industries that are leading innovation and leading economic growth over the last 10 years and into the future as we continue the recovery, areas like software, biotechnology, semiconductors, computers, and telecom are very highly, the number of jobs in those industries are very, very highly concentrated into venture-backed companies. And even though venture-backed companies represent a total of 11% of all jobs in the United States, they represent over 20% of revenue, over $3 trillion in revenue in 2010, comes out of the companies that are venture-backed. Also, because a lot of those are technology companies, uh, it's probably reasonable to assume that the margins are higher than a lot of industrial and manufacturing companies. So while venture-backed companies represent 20% of revenue generated in the United States, it's probably significantly more than that in terms of earnings. So this is all very good work. And this is one of my favorite pictures because it's very important for you to go out and create your business and get started. Have an idea, see if it works. If it works, go raise some money. If it doesn't work, go back and have another idea. There are a lot of organizations that can help you get your company started and get off the ground. Uh, this is a list of some of the companies that are here in New York. Some of them are regionally focused, like the, uh, some of the regional accelerators and incubators or the Council for Economic Growth. Some of them are also industry focused, like there's a MedTech group, there's the iClean is focused on clean technologies. And these are companies and uh, organizations that you can go to for support as you're getting your company started. But how will I finance it? Um, I think this is very important. It's important that everybody understands. Um, and I did not write this quote, but I think it says it very well. Making investments at the earliest stages of a company's development involves extraordinary risk. Young companies, which you all know, have little or no collateral to secure bank loans, no assets or track records to attract financing from private equity firms, and no opportunities for short-term gain to interest hedge funds. So venture capitalists step in and assume this risk by providing capital. But one of the things that's important here is the risk that's there. There's a lot of failure in a lot of early stage companies. A lot of people have to go back and change their ideas. And venture capitalists think very often about they need to invest in companies that have the opportunity to generate enough success to make up for the failures in their portfolio. So a rule of thumb is that most venture capital investors will look to return three to five times their invested capital in a, any given company over a four to seven year period. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear venture capitalists say that they can't look at the opportunity to invest in your company unless there's a chance that they can earn at least 10 times, because there have to be some 10 times in a typical venture portfolio. 
in order to make up for the inevitable zeros. Um, on average, the very top venture capital firms will typically only return two to three times their entire fund, um, and those are considered the best in the business, and part of the way they do that is by managing the risk. Before we talk a little bit more about how to finance the company itself, I want to take a detour. Uh, this one, this one I bet it's, oh, where'd it go? This one I bet is a slide you never thought you'd see in a finance presentation. Um, I think it's very important to talk about, is venture capital right for my business? Um, a venture capital investment is a partnership. It's a partnership between you and your investor, like it or not. Um, you're going to be working with these people as your board members, as your advisors, typically for four to seven years. You're going to be taking a lot of advice, some happy, some more challenging. And it's going to be very important to make sure that you find the right investor and make sure that you're the type of entrepreneur that is a good match for this kind of relationship. And it's important that you find the right investor who's going to be aligned with your goals. I started a few minutes ago by talking about why are you starting your company. Is it because you want to be the king? Is it because you want to be famous? Or is it because you want to be rich? Let me tell you how your investor sees it. The only thing your investor really cares about at the end of the day is returning capital. Because the way that the private investment model works is that we venture investors only generate uh, returns and generate income for ourselves when we return to our investors more money than we started with. So when an investor invests in your company, they typically purchase stock and they realize a profit or a return on that investment when the company is sold or when the stock is repurchased. So it's very important to understand that from day one, when you take money from a private investor, that investor is going to be concerned about, are you growing the company big enough so that one day you'll be selling it or you'll be able to repurchase it to buy our stock back? Um, one thing to think about is if you're starting your company because you want to be the king, um, having somebody looking over your shoulder asking you when the company is going to get to a point where you can sell it may not be the right match for you. The second thing that your investor cares about is time. A typical investment fund is a 10-year vehicle. That means that we're expected to invest the capital and identify the companies during the first five years. And during the second five years, focus on continuing to grow those companies and exit them. Um, especially in the current economic challenges, you know, that exit horizon has even extended. So it's very important to understand that if you are bringing private investors onto your side of the table to go on this journey with you, you're going to have to be prepared to have those conversations about are we growing fast enough, are we maintaining profitability, and are you going to be able to exit at some point to help me get a return on my investment so that way we can move forward. Now that we've covered that, I want to get back on track. You've decided that you're a good match, you're ready to undertake this relationship, and the next thing to think about is, is your company going to be a good match, something that's appetizing for uh, institutional and private investors? Not all companies are venture-backable. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just something important to think about. I had a conversation a year ago or so with somebody um, in our general region here who wanted to start a kayak rental business. He was going to raise money from investors, buy kayaks, and, and rent those kayaks to people who wanted to go on tours up and down the Hudson, which is a great idea. It could allow him to have a nice lifestyle, generate some income for himself. But think about if an investor invested $500,000 in this kayak rental business, is there really any conceivable way that that $500,000, the value of that investment could grow to the two and a half million to five million dollars that that investor would be looking for to receive on the other end? Something to think about. The, uh, the entrepreneur in this case is going to have a hard time if he tries to bark up that tree and, and find pro uh, professional investment capital because the return opportunities may not be there. It's a good lifestyle business for him but it's not really a good candidate for venture capital. Investors also like to invest in companies that solve a problem. This is one of my favorite pictures because this is probably about how I would have solved a Rubik's Cube yeah, back when I was a kid. Um, I, I wasn't even this smart. I took it apart and figured out how to put it back together. But if your company is figuring out a way to take a very complicated problem and a pain point that is almost universal and a simple way to sell it, that is the best way to find, uh, those are the kinds of companies that investors like to look at. 
I mean, when I, for, for medical technology investors, they may be looking at companies that are going to be an innovative drug or, a, or a, a new device or a therapy. For others, it could be a new way to deliver advertising or make it easier to communicate to people. But by having a problem that you're solving, it makes it much easier to convince to your customers why they want to buy it. It makes it much easier to enroll investors in your vision and, and how they can see the opportunity. It also makes it easier in the longer term to identify who your potential acquirers are going to be. Stonehenge focuses on investing in companies that apply proven technology to solve a business problem. Um, we have a focus currently over the, about half of our portfolio is looking at companies that are addressing the current challenges in delivering health care efficiently and cost effectively. We think that that's an emerging trend that is obviously getting a lot of press today that we think is going to continue over the next investment horizon for our new fund. Um, and we also believe that the greatest value to a community, to a company, um, and to investors is to is when you're applying technology to solve a problem. It's a, it's a, there, there continues to be a lot of opportunity, but yet a lot of risk in taking technology out of a lab. But it's once we can apply uh, investment capital to help sales and marketing and help that product and that solution find an audience, that's really where, uh, where the greatest value is driven. Historically, the most successful venture-backed companies are those that can grow or scale rapidly without repeat large investments. Uh, one of the things that we've seen through the internet revolution is it doesn't take $5 million to start a company today. You can start a company on a shoestring with employees working virtually by hosting everything in the cloud. A lot of that infrastructure um, has gone away. And one of the things that's most interesting to investors are companies that can scale without, continued, uh, without a lot of significant continued investment. If you look at our kayak rental business, for example, imagine if that entrepreneur had a vision where he could build a website f uh, to build an online community focused around river sports. Um, not only would you be limited to people in the local Hudson Valley, you could target river sports enthusiasts around the world. You could host advertising. You could, you could get companies to sell their product or their tours. There are many other ways where, where that type of business or an entrepreneur focused in that type of area could have looked at a much larger opportunity. Personally, I think there are a whole host of other challenges starting an online community business like that, but I wanted to use that as an example of a business that may be more scalable, may be more interesting to institutional investors. In that case, that wasn't what the entrepreneur had in mind. It wasn't what his vision was, and he's good to go off and do his thing. But I was giving an example of something that may have been more appetizing for a traditional investor. So uh, we're back to this picture again, because one of the most important things to do, finding a private investor, is often like finding a spouse. Uh, you want to know that through the ups and downs uh, and the good times and the bad times, you have a partner on your side of the table. Um, you also need to find an investor who wants to do what you want to do. There are some investors who are understanding uh, and willing to invest in pre-revenue companies where a lot of the technology risk is still on the table. There are some investors who are willing to, to invest in companies that are going to need $50 million to get a drug in development through the FDA process. Stonehenge is not one of those companies. But it's important to understand who, who that potential investor is. I always recommend that even before you start your company, you should be asking the question, am I an entrepreneur who really wants to take this kind of capital? Is my company the kind of company that could be appetizing for an investor? Uh, based on some of the things we've talked about, and who are those potential investors? I can't imagine a worse fate than an entrepreneur spending a lot of time building a company and expecting to go out and raise capital and finding that, that what they're doing is not a match for the capital that's out there. If you ask some of those questions, you can take some of that startup risk yourself off the table by building something that you can easily identify your customers and identify who your potential investors are. So once you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to think that your company is venture backable, you're ready to go out and get some money. And you automatically run into a wall because there is a very huge gap uh, right where you need it most. Uh, we've talked about some of the early, um, early sources that can help you get the advice to get your company started. They're um, in the seed and early, early, early stage rounds when you're finishing your product development and doing a lot of the commercialization and and development of the initial product. You can go to groups for SBIR grants or nice CERTA for some early stage grants or academic institutions for some opportunities to do that. Then you go and look at your friends and family and individual angels and angel groups even today as they are working more closely together are looking 
more often for companies that have a finished product already. And a lot of these local groups, a lot of these regional networks can help you get to a million dollars in revenue. But there still remains a large gap because a lot of larger uh, venture firms are focused on writing five to ten million dollar investment amounts in companies that are already at five million dollars of revenue. I mean, it's important to think about how can you scale your company to get through that gap, particularly in areas that are outside the beaten path of New York City, Boston, or Silicon Valley, where there isn't a lot of readily available professional capital. One of the things that we focus on um, in this stage are the technology risk. I call that the will it work risk. Um, and the second risk is market adoption risk, is you know, can you convince somebody to pay money for your product? Do you really solve the problem? I mean, those are some of the things that are really important in here, and those are the things that will help you uh, get over the gap. In fact, early stage funding has always been challenging to get, but you can see in this chart from 2000, it dipped to almost 5% of total invested capital was in the seed and early stage rounds. It's rebounded a little bit uh, to just over 12% or 10% today. Um, I would argue that a lot of that capital going to very early stage companies is still chasing after you know, me too, photo sharing, social media type apps, a lot of what you see in Silicon Valley in New York. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for companies that are really solving business problems um, and that have a real refinable uh, return on investment for customers and investors, but it's very, very hard for those companies to, 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 uh, to attract capital at the earliest stages. These are some of the groups that are doing that. I mentioned when we started that I'm vice president of the Upstate Venture Association of New York. It's really our mission to, to continue education and help entrepreneurs get on the right path when they're starting their companies, help make introductions to capital, and bring capital providers and entrepreneurs around the table at the same time across Upstate New York. Uh, the other groups that are doing incubation, acceleration, um, early stage funding, uh, forums where you can go and, and show your company, there are a lot of them in our region. For those of you uh, watching us online, I'm sure there are plenty in your regions as well. So where does Stonehenge Growth Equity fit into this picture? Uh, the vast majority of what Stonehenge does is we focus on growth equity stage companies. And we, uh, you can see the chart there, we, we define growth equity stage companies as companies that are past the traditional early stage risks of does the product work and is somebody willing to pay for it? Uh, the majority of the companies that we invest in are at, uh, they're at two to $10 million in revenue. Um, often we have invested in companies that are earlier than that, but they're always, you know, more than zero revenue because the most valuable due diligence point for us is to be able to call customers and say, does it say what you think it's going to say? Does it solve the problem that you expected to solve? And is it worth more or less than what you're paying for it? The second thing is that um, we think that it's very important with the capital that you raise to look at profitability. Um, I know a lot of focus on on a venture type earlier stage companies is rapid growth, rapid growth, and rapid growth. But we think very importantly, when you're in an area like upstate New York or western Pennsylvania or other areas around the country where there's not a lot of readily available local capital, the single best thing that you can do to make your company appetizing is to prove that there's a growth opportunity by, by generating revenue but also prove that you can use your capital because the worst thing that you want to do is burn through your first round of financing and be in an area where finding that second round of financing is really challenging. Focusing on profitability, focusing on being efficient with your sales process is a way to allow yourself to control your own destiny. The second thing that we do is in addition to our growth equity investing, we, uh, we also, Stonehenge was recently awarded $5 million from Empire State Development's Innovate New York program. This is a program targeting seed stage and early stage investments. This $5 million allocation will require a matching amount. Um, so what we're looking at is we're looking to deploy this capital into companies that are in th at the intersection of healthcare and IT. We've looked at companies, we have investments in companies that are applying software and services to the clinical trials process to make it more efficient. We're invested in companies that are focused on electronic medical record management. How do you get records back and forth? How do you manage care of family members who are far away? Um, we typically like to invest in these companies. Even though they're at the seed stage, we want to make sure that there are at least initial indications of customers. Can we call somebody who says that they're using it? 
Um, can we do that? Does the product work? And is, it can, is the solution going to be adopted, take some of those risks away? We aim to make a million, one million dollar investment in these companies. About half of that would be out of the Innovate New York pool. The other half would be out of Stonehenge's other fund. Um, what will we not do? Uh, we will not invest in drug discovery therapeutic companies that typically require many millions of dollars to get to revenue generation. Uh, same thing with medical devices. The regulatory risk and the capital requirements are challenging for a fund of our size. Um, we all, I always say that we don't, we don't invest in science projects. Uh, we, we, we really are looking to invest in companies that have a product, that have a technology that has been validated that is being used to solve a business problem. Um, to date, since 1999, my partner in Tampa and myself have invested about $45 million in 29 companies. Um, about 12 of those companies are in New York State. Seven of those 12 companies are headquartered in upstate New York or have significant presence in upstate New York. We're currently in the process of raising $100 million, including this Innovate New York money to continue building on this platform. So we're very interested today in talking to uh, companies and looking for opportunities. We, um, we're, uh, we're targeting uh, additional investments to, to be looking for new companies to invest in towards the end of the year. Uh, one of the things that's important working in these underserved markets is we know that it's all about relationships. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with our CEOs, working with our management teams, and working with others in the community to build trusted relationships. Uh, when you have trust, even if we're not the largest investor in the company, um, very often our CEOs will call us and say, hey, Brian, I've got a board meeting on Tuesday, and I know that John is going to react this way. How do you think I should handle it? Working with, your, with, the, with the rest of the board and with the management teams as a partner, as a collaborator, not a dictator. There are things that are important to us, like financial controls and you know pipeline reports, but it's also important that you build them in a way that builds trust. And the most thing that I'm most proud of is the last three portfolio companies that we've invested in in New York have all been companies that we were introduced to by referrals from our CEOs. People who say, hey, if you're looking for money and want a good partner, you've got to call the guys at Stonehenge. And that's, to me, that's the best validation. We also bring to table a deep network of relationships. We have, because Stonehenge has offices in eight states, we have a deep network of co-investors who we can bring to the table. The best way to invest in, to attract capital to your company in upstate New York is to find an investor who can convince people from outside upstate New York to come up. Um, I identified a company in Rochester and introduced a New York City firm who came in and co-invested with us. And the first question they said to me was, am I going to have to go to Rochester to go to board meetings? Um, yes, you can handle it. It's really nice up there. Um, it's very important to have a local partner to help attract the rest of the capital to the community. Um, as I wrap up, I wanted to focus back to, we've talked about, is, are you a good match? Is your company a good match? And I wanted to circle back to, what are some of the things that investors are looking for? Um, you know, I know it's an old platitude, but they say the three most important things uh, in identifying an investment opportunity are management, management, and management. Um, it's kind of like when you're buying real estate, right? The, what's most important, uh, what we focus on are, does management have the, excuse me, do they, uh, can the management enroll others in their vision? It's a, it's a sales process as much as anything. You're selling your customers to buy your product. You're selling your investors to see your opportunity. I think that that's very important. Are you able to sell your business? Are you able to sell your vision? That's going to help you attract customers. It's going to help you attract investors. It's going to help you attract employees. It's going to help you achieve the goals that you set. The second thing that's important to us is, does the management team have relevant domain expertise? Just because you like to play golf doesn't mean that you're the right entrepreneur to turn the golfing industry upside down, right? Do you have, do you have experience? Just like you should be looking for investors who have done something similar to what you set out to do so that way you can increase your chances of success. Um, we look at management teams. Have you, ha have you had experience in the medical records business and therefore you have credibility with us that you're going to be able to solve a problem? Helps understand that you've lived through that problem. The third thing is flexibility. We all know that there's going to be bumps in the road. We all know that your sales cycle is going to take longer than you expected or your customer is not going to react the way that you had thought they were going to react. And working very closely in a collaborative relationship with your board is very important. We want to know from the beginning one of our important due diligence points points is understanding what that flexibility is in that relationship because you know that you're not all plan A is not always going to work but are you going to be able to shift over to plan B when necessary is very critical 
the next thing we talk about, uh, again, this is a repeat slide because it's so important to remember that your company needs to solve a big problem. By being able to articulate what that problem is, is the best way to give customers that aha moment. I've been, I don't know how I ever live without this. I have to pay for it. Um, it also helps you enroll customers. It helps you enroll um, investors. Um, and it makes it easy to think about future acquirers. Remember that from the moment I invest, I'm going to be thinking about who am I going to sell this company to in five years. Um, thinking about how big that problem is also helps you identify who your investors are because you can see what they've done before. It helps you identify who your acquirers are and how you can strategically grow the business over that five-year period to make sure that you're most appetizing at that end point. The next most important thing is generate revenue. Um, I, I know it sounds obvious, but the day you ring the cash register is the day you can prove that I've solved a problem that somebody cares about solving and I've made somebody uh, happy. I've made somebody willing to put money on the line. Um, it proves that the technology is proven in a lot of ways. Even if it's a beta project, it just proves that there's validity there and it means that the company's on the right path. A lot of investors will see revenue generation as a critical gate. We can, you know, a lot of people will say that they won't talk to you until you're generating revenue. Uh, and there's a lot of flavors to revenue, but that's something that's very important. Finally, be passionate, right? Nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Um, it comes from having vision, having, having a vision. One of the things I mentioned earlier is are you starting this company to change the world? Um, even if your goal, the secret is even if your goal is you're starting your company to get rich, you really have to convince people that you're going to change the world because that's going to get your customers signed up. That's going to help you attract the best people to work with you, and that's going to help you attract um, investors. My, um, my contact information is here. Um, I live and work down in New York. Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, upstate and other areas, um, so please feel free to reach out to me with your ideas, suggestions, questions, or anything else. I, I appreciate the time today. We've got time for one or two questions, and then Brian will be around if anybody has anything they'd like to say. One question. All right, we've got to identify yourself. And Thank you for the presentation. I'm Harv Hillowitz. I own ARC Business Services. Uh, one of the questions I had was, uh, when you come upon companies uh, looking for investors, obviously they have their own challenges already. Otherwise, they would be where they wanted to be uh, a few years ago. Uh, in terms of the challenge of management, does Stonehenge Group uh, assist in any ways like to uh, help them get a management team going or any, any of those kinds of things aside from just providing financing? One of the biggest risks um, is management risk, and you want to make sure that you have as full a management team as possible. But every company at the stage in which we typically look does have you know, needs in their management team. And we work very closely um, coming out of bank one and looking at uh, finance the way we do. We do think it's important once a company a, a, a real startup, early stage company doesn't always need a full-time CFO, but we do think having financial controls, growing into a CFO is important. We work very closely with our companies to report to recruit team members, I mean also to recruit board members. I think having having board members that have industry expertise around the table is very important. We go into our network for that. One of the things though, I will say is um, I've seen companies that. Um, it's somebody out of an academic lab who says, I've got this great technology and it's going to work, but I need to hire a CEO to help me run it. That's, that's going to be something that we're not interested in. Um, you know, you need to have a, a driving CEO, often um, somebody who's leading the sales process in the earliest stages to be able to enroll us because those are the people that we're going to back. Over, over 29 companies since 1999, we have never once fired a CEO. Um, and that's something that we're very proud of. We work very closely with our management teams to counsel and coach them. Um, but we, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's Colin Powell's doctrine, right? I don't really want to do a lot of nation building. I want to work with the teams to help them augment, but we don't want to build them from scratch. Brian, we have a question online. Uh, Sarah, you want to address the question? Hi, we have a question from Howard from our online audience. He wants to know 
Have you made any investments in telemedicine or teleradiology? Question was, have you made any investments in telemedicine or teleradiology? Well, thanks a lot for the question. We've looked at some opportunities um, in both of those areas, but we haven't yet. Uh, the closest that we've done is we've invested in a company in Rochester. We have two companies in Rochester, one of which is focused on the um, collection, retrieval, and access of medical records, um, and the other one is focused on applying uh, cardiac safety research through the clinical trials process. Um, there are a few companies that we've looked at in both New York and Florida that are looking at various aspects of telemedicine and radiology, but we have not yet invested in them. I certainly would be willing to look at them. I know you're over here, but uh, thanks for joining. <laughs> Great. Brian will be around uh, for questions anytime afterwards. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. We My pleasure. It. Thank you. Okay, good morning, Kai. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, I'm going to bring up your presentation. Okay, now I will bring up your slideshow, and you got to tell me when you want me to advance. I've already introduced you twice, so uh, everybody knows how you, how, who, who you are. So uh, why don't you give them a little background? Yeah, uh, the, uh, if you have been showing the uh, the slide uh, is a short presentation of, of what I've done in my life and, and, and just now sitting with uh, one of the, the most important company for me which is uh, Respect uh, which I developed together with the, the founder of the body shop uh, we started that nine uh, uh, year 2000 and um, we just now in to take a new step on the market and, and uh, uh, selling value, values-based consultancy on uh, in the market of climate uh, change, mostly. How long have you been involved in clean tech and climate change? Well, uh, well, I've I've been touched with the field of uh, uh, environmental issues in thirty years, uh, and I've been working in government office. I've been working in NGOs. I've been working in business. Uh, I have have all the different type of perspective you can think about uh, in this field. Uh, and now I'm mostly connected to, to, to the, the company respect I'm doing with, work with uh, in the market. So um, if, if we take, uh, if you can see the slide, first slide. Uh, it's up on the, it, it's, it's here. I'll, I'll go through it and uh... You can talk to it. Uh, this, it's the Sweden of today. Sweden, of, yeah. Because I'm, I'm coming from uh, uh, the biggest island uh, in Sweden, uh, Gotland, uh, the last week. And, and uh, that's uh, the hot spot for the political discussion and also the, the future discussion of uh, the, uh, the relationship between uh, politics and business and their stakeholders. And it was uh, 17,000 people, all the political party was there. It was a crowd, and, and you see, it was 300 seminars a day. So we had a big problem to, to, to attend to, to, to all of them. So, uh, but there was a lot of uh, high flyers, uh, uh, political party leaders, uh, CEOs of different branches, uh, which are uh, coming back to that. Um, uh, uh, which areas because it has an impact also for the investment sector in, in the hot uh, areas in Sweden just now but um, so I have sort of very much of an updated situation and I could promise you that 30% uh, of all the discussion this uh, political week in Almedal and in Gotland was uh, connected to sustainable development Kai, what is, what is the uh, climate right now for investment in clean tech, not just in Sweden, but from your perspective throughout Scandinavia and Europe? Well, uh, if you look at Sweden, and, and uh, you can see that all the political parties have uh, investment and innovation as a priority on the, uh, on the agenda now. And uh, the government is coming with a new uh, paper in the autumn uh, with the support of... of uh, uh, to, to make it easier for people to invest in the sector of low carbon economy and um, I think also uh, uh, the opposition trying to uh, do a, a more better program than that so 
it, it, it is a sort of a dialogue now to how to support the, the growth in the industry regarding low carbon economy uh, is it's a priority for all. You had listed in your in your in your presentation the acceleration and growth of new clean tech enterprises in 2010. Uh, reflecting a 12% increase from 2009. How do you see that growth pattern continuing? Well, uh, I, I see this, uh, uh, it's a different segment of the market which uh, has um, an incredible growth. And uh, it's uh, also the involvement of the political sector as when you look through uh, the, the cities, and uh, the role of cities and green procurement policies, uh, it will be taken into place. And you know, the, the procurement policies uh, is a huge, uh, has a huge impact of, of the, to uh, make focus on different issues regarding environment. And um, uh, all local government uh, are working now to uh, develop their tools on green procurement and uh, both with policies and actions. And uh, also you can see uh, the role of cities where you have to develop different types of infrastructure investment and also transportation sectors and, and the, the, it's a very uh, high profile on sustainable city as a word and within that you have all uh, issues around infrastructure uh, buildings, uh, transportation, waste, uh, water issues, and um, uh, that's what I see as uh, uh, the, the, the biggest growth in the coming years. Is the investment in clean tech in Sweden, Scandinavia, as prolific as it is here in the United States? Well, um, I, I can see uh, uh, we have some similar tendency in in both in Europe and and uh, uh, and Scandinavia. Um, when you talk with uh, uh, organizations like the C40 and Bill Clinton and and uh, Bloomberg's uh, activities around the climate issue and also sustainable city development, it's the same sound uh, also in Scandinavia. Uh, and uh, the, the, the most advanced concept regarding sustainable cities you find in Malmö uh, and in Stockholm, uh, where you have different types of solution uh, regarding energy, energy efficiency, soil and wind, uh, solar uh, cells and wind uh, systems. And um, particularly in Sweden and Scandinavia, we have an advantage to look at systems uh, for solved problems in cities. And uh, for example, um, uh, we look at district heating and cooling, uh, which uh, is the most important um, uh, uh, infrastructure investment for to build a sustainable city. But if you, uh, do you have the, uh, the, the slide of Sweden fact and figures? Well, we're watching you rather than your slide, so I'll, I'm repeating a lot of the information that's on your slide. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so uh, what I put up as areas where you see the most increasingly activities uh, is uh, connected uh, to forest, uh, energy and bioenergy, water and waste, transport, district heating and cooling, and the concept of sustainable cities. And the areas where you see the, 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 the tendency that are stronger than other parts of Sweden, you, you find some places up in the, in the north of Sweden, Stockholm area, the west coast, and in Skåne in south. And um, uh, uh, the government was also putting up uh, a new program for environmental technology, which also will help uh, foreign investment in in uh, in this sector. So they they put up some money for 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 foreign investment in in the field of environment technology. Now you've been very involved for a long time uh, globally. 
How do you see the trend globally for the acceptance of clean tech? Well, I, see, I, this is a sector which I also connect to the low carbon economy, which is uh, the sector that has been growing uh, most in all over the world. And uh, in, in, when you look at the BRIC countries, when you look at uh, the, the north part of Europe, uh, when you even look at in, in US, you, you have uh, this part of development. And, and that's the only sector in the industry which is growing. And what sectors, what sectors are you directly uh, more, more involved in than others? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not in, in, in all details around the investment uh, programs, but um, I have a general view and, and can see that um, in Scandinavia, you know, we have a lot of forest and, and we can solve our transportation uh, through the forest and, and uh, to be really climate neutral uh, in, in um, uh, 2030, 2040 maybe. And um, the sources from the forest is going in different directions. One is uh, uh, to find the next generation of, um, of uh, uh, transportation uh, fuel. And um, uh, the, the cellulosa is uh, uh, and the development uh, from, from the cellulosa to, to methanol. Um, it's, um, it's increasing investment. Uh, we had one example, which uh, I, I'm coming back to that. In, uh, I will go into a little bit more detail. It's an interesting uh, development in, in, in uh, some region, which uh, they are looking for much more of investment. But it's uh, also interesting because India is involved in that. But forest uh, and raw material from the forest is interesting to look at. And uh, cellulosa development. Uh, and uh, it's going the direction of of uh, uh, the textile industry and to the um, to the heating system and also to the transportation and bioenergy. Bioenergy, and you know that uh, uh, today Sweden uses more bioenergy than fossil fuel in the total mix of of, uh, of uh, energy use. So uh, bioenergy have passed fossil fuel. We did that two thousand nine. Is that a cost savings? Is that an energy savings? Uh, and, and does the public readily accept it? Well, uh, the new sales, uh, when we look at transportation, you can see that uh, um, the car sales um, uh, and the environmental friendly cars, they, uh, the statistics the last month was 43% of all sales of cars. Um, and uh, the consumer is starting to demand much more. And, and for example, you can see uh, the biggest airport in Stockholm, Arlanda Airport. Uh, they all only allowed environmental friendly taxi to go to the airport. So just to wrap up, your conference last week I heard was very successful, was very well attended. What do you think were the top takeaways from the conference? Well, I... I think uh, it will, uh, as I always have said, that the political sector has been behind. The business sector is in front. And uh, now the politicians starting to catching up. And um, to understand that uh, it is growth uh, within sustainable development. And uh, that maybe it will change also the, the incentives uh, from the government to support this development. Because M when we look at the target that uh, Sweden is going to go uh, climate, uh, uh, climate neutral to 2050. And um, uh, they need also to look through the different types of incentives, the uh, regulation and smart regulation to support the new sector to grow. And that we will see, uh, that's my, my um, uh, conclusion, that we will see much more of uh, this support uh, from the political leadership in in all political parties, and uh, but to succeed really to to work on this field, that you you need to understand also the the Scandinavian model of how you work with investment, and you have the different types of of networks. And I know that the the American has been very active, and the the former uh, ambassador of, of uh, U.S. Uh, 
and he created a huge network and which I uh, would like you to look at uh, the Swedish American Green Alliance uh, saga uh, which um, also uh, give you a very good view of areas say green Scandinavia and Sweden in particular of different uh, new uh, growth opportunities. And then you have organizations like Clean Tech Scandinavia, you have um, supporters of uh, the network of, of Connect, which is very active in the north of Sweden and Norway. We have also a new organization for innovation offices uh, connected to the universities. We have 11 universities who get support from the government to uh, take care about science and development from the first growth of, of new solutions. And uh, then, of course, one of the biggest players is the Swedish Energy Agency, because this is a sector that um, uh, has a key for to uh, put money into pilot schemes, of, uh, particularly in, in uh, areas of energy efficiency and new renewable energy. And then you have all the business regions in Sweden, you have sustainable business hubs, and, which are also new creations that have, have the focus on sustainability. So, um, and you need to work with these type of networks to, to really to succeed. That's great. Kai, thank you very much. I'm going to open up if there are any questions or comments. Kai, I think we're good. Thank you so much. I apologize for the technical difficulty at first, but I think the wait was worth it. And you can uh, also, if you would like to have my uh, presentation and, and be in contact, I send, uh, you can uh, look at my email address. or. Perfect. I'll put it up on the screen for all to see. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, and I wish you a good day. Thank you very much.